So welcome to our third interview in this series. Today I'm joined by Dr. Virginia Walker from the Queen's Department of Biology. Um, Dr. Walker's research focuses on the molecular basis of stress genes um, and resistance, um, and that includes the production of ice-binding antifreeze proteins. Um, so welcome, Dr. Walker. Thank you very much for inviting me. Would you mind sharing with us how you got interested in your research, particularly with um, stress genes with respect to organisms living in cold environments such as the Arctic? Okay, so if you think about the universe in general, it's, it's a cold place and it's hard to estimate what the temperature actually is, but it's probably around minus 270. So probably like you, I was brought up on uh, Star Trek and, and uh, <laughs> science fiction. I was very interested. Did you feel the siren call of these uh, the books or movies about uh, outer space? And yeah, so? a little bit. Yeah, I was fascinated. Okay, so I was I was also the same, and so minus, as I said, very cold. And if you look at Earth itself much of it is uh, at low temperature. So maybe continuing this notion of, you know, trying to discover what's out there, I think it was a Star Trek episode that said it's the, uh, you know, what, what's fascinating is the unknown possibilities of existence. Okay. And if you pick up any microbiology, you took micro 221? Yes. If you pick up any microbiology book on, on organisms living in strange places or whatever, something like 80% of the book usually is hot springs and, you know, underwater smokers and so on, and it's not low temperatures. So always like to march to a beat of a slightly different drum and so okay. looking at low temperatures. So I guess from your past work, what have you found are some of the key adaptations that certain species of microbes that live in the Arctic that might be useful for living in a cold environment such so as the okay, Arctic? Okay, so one of the experiments that I had done at one time was to go and simply dig some soil from the garden, uh, you know, not even being up north because it's expensive to go up there, um, and thought that maybe I could use genetics to select for low temperature stress tolerance. Right. So did freeze-thaw experiments on just dark garden dirt, and then came up with all these different isolates, which turned out to be the same ice or to be the same genus and species oftentimes that you would find in the high Arctic or in glaciers and so on. And so I was struck immediately by their beauty, all different colors. And why? Because if you're in the Arctic space, you have to wear sunglasses, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you don't have uh, protection, uh, much protection, especially nowadays, you know, the ozone hole and so on. So they're really at risk. So what I'm saying is the bacteria wear sunglasses, they're beautiful colors like orange and red and blue and so on that you see when they're growing in a colony. So sunglasses would be one. The other thing is that they have to, uh, they have to withstand freezing. So oftentimes that means protecting from desiccation because as you know, when water freezes, it freezes external to the cells. And so what happens is that you then dehydrate the cells. So cells make essentially solutes and so on to, to keep a hold of that water inside. So okay. many of the ones that we had isolated did have that. And I guess there's other adaptations. Oftentimes these bacteria are necessarily resistant to freezing and so they have to escape. And so as they don't move very quickly, they have to think of clever ways to escape. So for example, you have we isolated some bacteria that were quite freeze-thaw sensitive, but they make ice nucleation proteins, which I guess when they get blown up into the atmosphere, which is oftentimes cold, they don't like it there, they want to get down to Earth, so you just nucleate some ice and you will fall down and use that as a dispersal mechanism and get back down to, to better temperatures. So all kinds of really cool 
adaptations. Yeah, that is really cool. It sounds like they're kind of precipitating out of thin air. Like the exactly. Yeah. So if you look at it in a snowflake, in the middle of the snowflake, we'll see a little bacteria. Wow, that's interesting, yeah. Do you think it would be possible, or has it already been done, where you can engineer something like an E. coli cell to become tolerant to the cold? I think you can. I think the, the bacteria can do anything. <laughs> so I think selection, uh, cold resistance, and certainly I did that in, i done that in a limited way um, with some students, but not in a concerted effort. But I'm sure that you can. Things like would E. coli then generate solutes that would increase when uh, the temperatures lower so they won't have as much of the water escape, sure. But of course, you're interested in biofilms, and the, the yeah. other way they can do that is participate in biofilms. For our project, we're looking at implementing um, ice binding properties to bacteria biofilms um, through genetic engineering. So um, would you care to explain what gives an antifreeze protein its ice binding ability? The structure of the antifreeze protein is repetitive, and as you know, ice is water molecules that are organized into ice are yes. also repetitive. So that that's kind of a maybe a, a simplistic way of looking at it, but by organizing those water molecules on the surface of the bacterium, if the water molecules are organized in such a way that matches that of ice crystals, then when the two come together, they can simply merge. Okay. The antifreeze proteins would kind of have these repetitive structures and they would match kind of the lattice structure formed by ice. You've got it. Okay. Exactly. So in your past work, you've also looked at bacteria that produce biofilms mm -hmm. um, on the surface of overwintering plants. So I was wondering if you could explain how biofilms can contribute to a microorganism survival in okay. the cold environment. Well, if you have that, you could probably write a paper on it. So I would encourage you. So biofilms actually very fascinating. You have individual planktonic bacteria, and they they come they somehow associate with a surface usually, and these surfaces then can attract more members of uh, more bacteria that are the same, or even other different um, genera of bacteria and they work together and they make this matrix and the bacteria talk together so you've taken microbiology so you know that when I'm saying talking together that means that they are exchanging chemical signals in something called quorum sensing right. so they say essentially to each other hey don't act as individuals anymore let's act as a community uh, and a particular type of, of community in that we're now not going, we're going to be closely associated. And they build something that perhaps looks like a termite mound in that it has channels through it so that they can then uh, get the nutrients they need and they can channel it right through. Um, I suppose like a termite mound, you're also setting up uh, like tides or currents so that it's easily exchanged. You then get a division of labor, like termites again, in that not all of them have to have all the metabolic activities that they had before. So such shut down some of their gene expression with their friends doing some of that so that they can exchange, uh, you know, exchange nutrients in that way, but save energy. And so they're all working together and they become, even the same bacteria, become something different. So they only, as I say, only express a subset of those gene of the gene expression and so on. So it's uh you know what it's like? We were talking about science fiction. It's like the Borg. The Borg where they had this community, where they were all controlled, there was the the community controls everything in, and they're no longer individual bacteria. Oh, okay. Are there certain signals in the environment that can perhaps favor biofilm formation over others? Oh, indeed. Yeah. I think to be honest, 
on this uh, thing about space, so you're probably going to boot me now and say, <laughs> get out of the room when we're not exobiologists. But if you compare the kinds of biofilms that are made on the space station to the ones that are made here on Earth, they're quite different. So obviously gravity has an impact on those kind of uh, biofilms. And so they're much thicker in space, so obviously part of the thing that they're fighting against maybe is gravity and, and you know, the shackles of Earth. Have you ever um, personally studied the kind of biofilms that form in space? No, I haven't done, I'm not an astrobiologist, <laughs> although, you know, I talk about it in Micro 221 yeah. a little bit, but I am, the only thing I'm doing in that regard is I do have a collaboration with some researchers at MIT that are involved with the um, next generation of Mars rovers looking at, um, looking to detect if there's past signatures of life on Mars and I have a collaboration with them um, with some of the work we've done on salt lakes in uh, BC. Okay. Which the salt lakes happen to be the same kind of magnesium sulfate as the uh, paleo lakes on, on uh, Mars did, so that's why it's of interest. You've looked specifically also into gas hydrates mm -hmm. and their formation in Arctic oil drilling. Um, so can you share with us what some of the harm that gas hydrates impose on surrounding ecosystems, um, as well as the kind of micro microbial products that you've looked at in your research that inhibit them? Well, we need the whole day to talk about this. So gas, you know what gas hydrates are? They're when water, water essentially, as you know, water molecules move all around. Mm -hmm. And so the water is a liquid because all these water molecules are moving. So if you bring in a gas, a small gas, it can, um, it can be surrounded by water molecules like a cage and the gas essentially makes those water molecules stop moving. So you can then have water crystallize even at temperatures above zero because the, the guest is stabilizing it. Okay. So gas hydrates form, gas hydrates formed in the Gulf of Mexico when they had that blowout. Right. And do you remember that they were trying to seal it up by putting a cap on it? Yeah. And it couldn't seal and they, they, they couldn't do it. And the reason why was the gas hydrates were forming and building up on top of the, the place where all this oil was coming out, forming essentially ice wow. over top, which prevented them from sealing it. So there was a temperature, I mean, it was under the uh, sea, so there was some pressure, but the temperature probably was only about, was four degrees, so low, but not freezing and yet this was forming. So it turns out that when you send, uh, say, things like propane or whatever, through, uh, through pipes and so on, that's under pressure as well. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily low temperatures, but the sufficient pressures so that any moisture in that, in that pipe, it's hard to get rid of moisture, yeah. it's gonna form gas hydrates, and you can actually bung up these pipes, and then you can imagine what happens can lead to explosions, right? right? So yeah. build up with pressure. So it's a big concern, this, these gas hydrates. Yeah. Um, and it's a concern in the Arctic because you've already got some low temperatures there, right? Yeah. And then you just need a little bit of pressure and you can form it. So they're very concerned with getting rid of these gas hydrates, and one of the ways they do that is they essentially lower the temperature which they form and they can put that, it's like putting salt on ice uh, on the roads in the winter. So you add, you add these salts and it will lower the temperature. So what they do is they put in ethylene glycol, which is a poisonous alcohol, which then will lower the, uh, the temperature in which it forms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, spilling all this or using all this ethylene glycol in kind of a one-to-one -one ratio of these formation of gas hydrates is very bad for the environment. Yeah, you've looked at some gas hydrate inhibitors, specifically right. ones that um, are related to ice binding proteins. Yeah, um, so antifreeze proteins yeah. can inhibit gas hydrates. Okay. So 
that we discovered in, uh, that in our lab and maybe it was a bit of a fluke because I didn't understand the structure of gas hydrates then. Right. And so I thought, well, this is kind of like ice. Kind of like ice, but different, but maybe we should just see if it inhibits. And it shouldn't have worked because the structure of a, of a gas hydrate snowball, which yeah. looks like a regular snowball, except you can light it and it will burn, and you can hold it in your hand and it will burn. Um, the actual ice crystal structure is different, okay. but it's still repetitive. Right. So if you have this repetitive, we started out me telling you you have a repetitive protein in yeah. some way, and it's organizing waters that will then somehow match. If it's repetitive, you can imagine it's like an old-fashioned accordion or squeeze box. And maybe it can just, the protein can just wiggle just a little bit and so match it. So I think that's what's happening. Okay. How big of an issue do you think oil drilling in the Arctic is right now? And with the current global efforts in combating climate change, do you think there is a decreasing trend in oil exploration in the Arctic or not? Well, this is 2017. So right now, oil prices are, are low, yeah. and that's because there's a lot of fracking going on, and so and in addition to that, we have alternative energy coming on stream. Right now, at the price of oil, I don't think you're going to see a lot of a lot of drilling in the Arctic. So whether it will come on board in the future, one doesn't know. I think that scientists are very bad at looking into the future, but my guess is that we're going to have green energy is going to play a bigger, bigger role. But are we still going to need these hydrocarbons in order to make our various plastics and right. so on? Maybe we'll be able to make them with plant-based material. That's That remains to be seen. One. Final question and I'll cap off this interview. Um, what has been your, what would you consider to be the most exciting find in your career as a researcher? I guess working with delightful students oh, okay. and watching students progress from getting a little project that they did almost didn't understand and working on it and having them make it their own and then going to find wonderful things about it and teaching me. I guess that's my most pleasurable find. My it's great to hear you. Yeah. It's great having you here, Dr. Walker. Um, thank you for joining us for our interview. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you.